Market Musings Podcast. Well, welcome on to the Market Musings podcast here from Stockbox. It's good to be starting these podcasts again after a bit of a summer hiatus. My co-host Pam Sidhu is joining us today to host the podcast. Pam, how are you doing? How are things with you, first of all? I'm doing really well, other than the weather, you know. Well, uh, it's definitely turned autumnal, hasn't it? It definitely has. It's like a switch has been hit and we're in autumn, out of summer. Indeed, indeed. Well, it's Great to be here with you today, Mark, and looking forward to this. Yes, indeed. And our guest, Jason Brewer uh, from Marula Mining, is our guest today. The first time, Jason, we've obviously been talking a lot, interviewed, Pam's interviewed you, I've interviewed you a fair bit on Stockbox. You know, you're on a fair bit with all the the, the, the activities that are going on with Marula, but we've never actually done a Market Musings podcast. We did to learn about Jason Brewer, the man. So thank you for your time. How are you doing? No, I'm good, actually, Mark, Pam. No, no, very good. It's the start of another week here. The weather's obviously a damn sight better here in Kenya than it is in London or, or Europe, so yeah. nothing really to complain about. Good, nothing to complain about. That's what we like to hear, isn't it? That's what we like to hear. So, I mean, I'm quite keen to learn about your history, Jason, you know. Um and no one can see the video here, but there's a few smiles going around. Um, and I'll just, yeah, I'll just, I'll just sort of say my piece to begin with. You know, I think when we first, when I first interviewed you, oh, it would, I don't know when it was, probably, yeah, three years ago or something. I thought, here we go, here's a, here's a, here's a lad, here's a, here's a, a dealer. And I was skeptical, I must admit, Jason. Um, but you know, I've got to know you over the years, uh, respect you. Uh, you know, seeing what you, what you're building, what you're doing with uh, Marula, how you have delivered on. Pretty Pretty much most of the promises you know, it'll always take a little bit longer in this sector than everyone would like to uh, to hope and of course what's going on with Quinton van der Berg and of course AUO and all that you know setting up to look uh, like it could have a pretty bright future so you know I, you know we get on quite well these days but I am quite keen to learn a bit more about uh, your your history really and you can go back really as far as you want if you want to go back to, to where you were born where you grew up or you want to start from school or something but you know if we can learn a bit about the history of Jason Brewer and what his childhood was like that would be a great start Jesus how long have you got um <laughs> you don't want me to go want me to go back that far surely um look I I was actually born in the UK I know my English accent has has disappeared over the many years um, but no, I was born down in Plymouth, so a Plymouth Argyle football supporter. Um, grew up down there. My family were either in in the Navy, deep sea fishermen, or in the mining industry. So okay. I ended up in the mining industry. Um, went to the School of Mines in London, graduated from there, worked in Canada, South Africa, um, and Australia, and then ended up working for a couple of investment banks in, in the UK before moving to Australia just around the Olympics time to, to work for Rothschilds. So, yeah, a bit of um, mining engineering, got my hands dirty, got involved on the financing side, then ended up kind of coming back over to this on the corporate side when I was based out of, out of Perth. And for the past 20-plus years, been working on deals, mining ventures here in, in Africa, and most of that time actually been spent living here. So be that in South Africa... Zambia, Malawi, Kenya, Tanzania. Um, yeah, I tend to enjoy being very hands-on and getting out there and doing things. But, but yeah, it's, that's my background, I guess, money engineered. I, I did a postgrad in, in mineral law as well. So, yeah, I think I've come across most facets of what's needed to, to kind of build companies. But I love Africa, and I think between all the places I've visited, um, very comfortable here now, obviously in Kenya, and I've never worked better in my life. I can honestly say that. Okay. What is it? Well, about, cool. Let me just jump in here. What is it? I'm curious, Jason. What is it about Africa that you like? What draws you to there? Twenty. Um, that's quite a long time to be living out there. Yeah. Look, I actually I was a young student engineer that my first overseas kind of if you want to call it posting was to South Africa in the gold mines then you know and. Yeah, I was just fascinated by it, I think. And But what draws me here and what's kept me here has just been an ability to get things done. You know, if, if you actually have uh, ambition, if you actually have passion for something, 
and determination, determination more than anything else, you can actually get things done. And you're working in an environment where everybody here wants to better themselves. Everybody here wants to be successful. Um, and people can be. So, you know, people's visions, people's dreams actually can happen, but it, it, it requires a lot of hard work. And I, look, I lived in Australia. I lived and worked in London. London almost sapped all the energy out of me, commuting into London each and every day, you know, almost killed me. But coming here has just re, reignited my passion for getting things done. And it's the people that you surround yourself with. So, yeah, yeah. Africa, you can do that. You can actually get things done. It's not driven by class or it's not driven by you know your your background or anything like that it's actually down to your own personal drive and ambition so and would, would you say it. it's a better quality of life as well um it's a hard life because yeah you've got to really put in a lot of effort but you can you can have a very good life if you're willing to put in the effort and i think look i i've got family still back in the uk and you know, I I think, yeah, sometimes it's very easy to just accept the status quo. And I see that with a lot of my family, unfortunately. I see that with a lot of friends, a lot of people I was in university with. I don't think I've ever been somebody that's accepted the status quo. I've always just wanted to get out there and do things. And that's why, you know, I, I left home at a very young age, travelled around the world, and that's why I live here now in Nairobi. So would you mm. say, Jason, you know, when you just said then that you've never been one to accept the status quo, would, is it fair to say that you've always thought differently from others around you? I don't think I think differently. I just think the way I do. Um, uh, I've got, you know, people, other people tend to think and go about things in a different way. I, I don't criticise that. That's just how they've, they've grown accustomed to doing things. Whereas I think when you, you work here um, in various African countries, you, you tend to not accept the status quo. You're, always, you're willing to challenge it and you're willing to get up and do things. Um, one thing about living here in, in Kenya, and I've been here now for four years, which is amazing when you think I only came here initially for a three-month period. You know, I'm still here um, and I love it. It's Like I said, I never worked so, so well in all my life, but I think from being around the people here, it, it rubs off on you. You know, everybody here wants, to, like I say, everybody here wants to work, wants to get things done and wants to succeed. And it rubs off on you. It's almost, it, would you say it's almost like the early days of uh, the United States uh, and how that, uh, you know, that country was discovered with, yeah, I don't know, what what were they, what were they called? The trailblazers, was it? When, um, you know, lots of people migrated over there in, with the horse and, and, the, and the wagon and staked land, staked, you know, staked their claims and, and, and discovered oil, really, you know, and that, that, that kind of pioneering attitude of getting things done that perhaps we seem to have lost a little bit, maybe, in the West. Yeah, I think just too many people accept the status quo in, the, in, in, in Europe, in, in the developing world, because that's how they're told to do things. And, mm. and sometimes it's very hard to break into certain circles or to get things done unless you've got a certain background or unless you know Tom, Dick or Harry or, or whatever. Whereas I think here, your, your energy and drive, you know, counts for the majority of, of your success. You know, it's not, it, yes, it helps to know the right people, but don't get me wrong, but if you're willing to put in the effort, this is, one of those places where I think Africa as a whole is one of those places where you can still make it. You can still do it. And it's still, look, let's, let's not kid ourselves. Africa still has so many, it's got an abundance of riches. It's got abundance of opportunities. And the reason they're there is because people have been scared off in the past from doing it or regulatory requirements, investment have just prohibited it. But now I think you can do it. And I think from my point of view, you can do it from being on the ground. You can't do it from some fancy office in Soho or freaking London anywhere. You, you've actually got to be here to do it. That's the thing. Yeah, it's a beautiful place, isn't it? A beautiful part of the world, the smell and the, the food and the lifestyle. It's, uh, it's wonderful. I've never been to Kenya myself, but I've been to other African countries. I'm sure I'll be paying you a visit at some point, Jason. Um, and yeah, well, hopefully meeting uh, you and, and Quinton in person as well again. And that's another, you know, Quinton's also that visionary as well. I think he probably shares 
your vision, doesn't he, as well, you know, building something in Africa, getting, getting things done? Look, Quince is an African. Um, and, yeah, he's, he's that kind of entrepreneur that, that, again, if you think about it, he left, he left South Africa, went to Europe, went to the U.S., and was successful there. And I think sometimes when you, you move to a different jurisdiction, a different country, away from the comforts of home, if you want to call it that, you've actually got to work a damn sight harder. That's just, you know, that's just obvious. So, yeah, when I met Quinton a number of years ago, I think we hit it off quite well. And, yeah, we share a, a number of kind of common goals, common ambitions and, and so on. There's enough differences between us as well to make it a very good working relationship. I think you always need those differences. So, yeah, I, I quite enjoy it. There's no question about it. You mentioned the ambition a few times and common goals. Jason, what, what are your ambitions? What are your goals? Uh, look, one of the things I think since I've been here in Kenya, um, which someone has, has taught me, is the importance of family. And family is not just your immediate family. Family extends well beyond your immediate family. And I guess when you live in, in Africa, in Kenya, you understand that a lot more. So for me, one of the things that's really been call it reinstilled in me is that concept of family. And you're not just doing something for yourself. You're actually doing something for your family, for your loved ones, for those around you. You know, everybody's a brother, everybody's a cousin. So my ambitions are not my own. It, it's it's more about building something for my family, for for what's going to happen, not this year, not next year, but five, ten years down the track. So I'm build, I'm trying to build these mining companies up into something that's not going to be taken out mm. by another major mining company in twelve months. No, that's not the, not the goal. It's about just building something which I think is going to have something about it in in a couple of years' time. That's that's what I like to think. So when you say it's about building something up that's going to have something about it, you know, let us into your your vision for your family, the company yeah. vision. What is it? Yeah, you can't have something which is much the same as, as anything else. There's there's too many companies out there that are much the same. You know, similar strategies, similar focus. You know, it, it, what's one of the common things that shareholders talk about? Rinse and repeat. You know, it, everything's got to be – I want things to be unique. I want things to be different. I want – you know, that's why I'm involved with a number of companies. Each one's got a, diff, a very distinct strategy, a very different focus, be it geographically, commodity-wise, working with different people. So my ambition is, yes, I want to build Marula. Two and a half years ago, it was a shell company, had nothing. You know, it's, we've done several transactions. And doing a transaction in Africa is not easy. You know, we've done several transactions over the past years, and we're slowly building it up. And hopefully now we're on the cusp of having production for multiple operations. Generates cash flow, allows you to grow that business even further. So, you know, that to me, you're building something which isn't just, like I say, it's not going to disappear in a year's time, two years' time. But hopefully you've got that presence and that longevity that this, this is a five-year, a 10-year, a 15, a 20-year thing. And I'm, I'm trying to build something up which has that well, it's sustainability. So... Yeah, it's not short-term fixes. It's not kind of, I'm, I'm not thinking 12 months down the track. This is about growing something and, and giving people around me and people that support and follow me something to be proud of. You know, that, that's the thing. I'm, I'm past, you know, call it in my youth or my investment banking days, I'm past those things of, you know, working hard to get your big, you know, those bankers' bonuses, you know, those grotesque bonuses that you used to get in the city. I'm not driven by that anymore. I'm not driven by that anymore. It's, it's about building something a little bit different. So that's why I'm involved here. That's why I live here in, in Kenya. That's why I've got such good people around me, why I do the charity work as well, and, and why, again, I, I'm trying to, I don't know, be a little bit different from some of those other fat cat bosses or whatever that you see walking around London and, you know, going to those wine bars and spending all day there. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, Jason. How do you manage your mindset as you're going through? I mean, you talked about, you know, long-term goals, what you'd like to see from a ruler. You know, it's something a little bit different. Do you have, you know, do, do you think about mindset? Do you have goals that you look at thinking, right, okay, well, in six months, that's my goal. In 12 months, that's my goal. Do you do, you do anything like that? Yeah, you have to. It's the only way to keep saying. Because um, if you just deal with everything in front of you, 
you know, it can be quite over, overpowering or, you know, it just overwhelms you at times. So you've got to have that longer term kind of, right, this is what we're achieving here. This is the plan. You know, so, you know, it's, you may do an initial transaction, but it means more than that. It's always, you've, you've always got that, you know, that puzzle, you know, you're putting one piece in place, but you know where the next six or seven are going to follow from there. So, yeah, but the only way you can do that is having good people around you. Yeah, that's the key thing. If you're going to kind of plan these things out, it's all well and good having it in your head, but then you've got to kind of have the people that support you each and every part of the way. And it's not just about having people from the funding side or from this. It's it's about surrounding yourself with the sort of team that you can rely on. Yeah, and I think that's that's a key thing. It's it's with with doing a lot of this stuff. It, it's not short term. It's not you know one step at a time. You know, it's almost. Kenya's famous for its marathon runners, you know, not necessarily famous for its sprinters. So when I look at this, yeah, we're looking at, you know, that kind of running a marathon. You know, you, so you've got to plan out the, what is it, plus 40K run. You know, it's not just about a quick sprint to start with. You need to basically be looking a little bit further down the track. So what are some of those goals then, Jason? Could you articulate them? Yeah, look, I mean, when we talk about Marula, it's it's about turning that company very quickly over the balance of this year and into next year into having those multiple mining operations generating good revenue that is able to support and you know expansions upon that. So you know by mm-hmm. the end of this year, you know I want to have Marula sitting there with three or four, possibly even five producing mines, and on the back of that, you're building a big infrastructure around it where you've got one, two, 300 people working in that organisation across different countries. So you're starting to build a kind of a reputation there. We've already seen it in some of the opportunities we've seen where they see you doing stuff and they bring you other things to look at. So you grow. We've grown both organically and through corporate activity. So for me, Marula, by the end of 2025, you know, a very significant mining company, several hundred employees, those the assets, which initially when we started looking at Marula, it was about getting these assets into production very, very quickly. You know, start off smallly and small and then move on. Obviously, a strategy evolves. And mm-hmm. now, given the funding support we've got, we can actually look at these assets and think, you know what? There's a better way to do this than just starting small. You can actually look at the asset and say, actually, this demands us to look a bit bigger on it. And I think... As we get into 2025, we're going to be in a position where we can actually give some of those projects justice, not just do a, you know, a small-scale scratch-and-sniff style operation, but actually give it justice. You know, if you've got Canusi, massive resource potential there, very high grade. To do a small DSO operation just doesn't justify what, what's there. You've got to look to the bigger picture there to produce a copper cathode and to look at consolidation in that region there. I think as we go into 2025, that's going to be an asset where we can actually deliver it in a far better way. Blesberg at the same, you look at Blesberg, for instance, retreating stockpiles was was a quick win for us doing that DSO using the XRF solids. You've now got an opportunity there, which we're, we're pushing ahead with, with Chinese battery manufacturers, where they don't want to take, you know, tens of thousands of tons of low grade, not, not low grade, but 6% spodumene. Each month, they actually want to actually invest in us and do a partnership to produce an intermediate product that feeds directly into their battery plant. You know, all of a sudden now, what we look at has changed. We've evolved. And people are kind of, I like to think it's starting to take us a little bit more seriously than where we were 12 months ago, 18 months ago, because of the progress we've made across a lot of these projects. So, yeah, ambition changes. Your goals change. Um, and with Marula, we've actually started going you know, a bit bigger than I guess we, we thought we could have, could be. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, with the backing of AUO, of course, that gives you that, that opportunity. I mean, just coming back to, yeah, your youth, if you like, and perhaps that. Would you say you were a bit of a, a lad, a bit of a dealer, you know, ducking and diving, chasing those bonuses? And your sort of mindset, you say, has changed. But equally, just a few minutes ago, you said, you know, you've moved away from those quick wins at Marula and going for the longer term thing. So is there still some of that kind of 
in there in Jason Brewer, that kind of quick wins, low hanging fruit. But, you know, now you're seeing the bigger picture. Yeah, look, when I was at university, I had a great time. I had a great time. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I was. Um, played rugby. I was at the School of Mines in London. There was a School of Mines. I lived in Cornwall. Uh, my father was in the Navy, so we lived in Plymouth. We moved across into Cornwall. And I had the, the Camborne School of Mines, which is a great yeah. mining school down there. And that was literally just down the road from me. Um, rather than go there, I went to London, to the Royal School of Mines. Far, far better uh, university. but. Because in my mindset, that the streets of London were paved with gold, yeah, you know, and you know I stayed there, worked in the city, and so on. No, I had great fun during university, great fun as a young banker in London, um, great kind of lifestyle as it was then. But you, you it, like I said, it, it zaps your energy. You know that commute each and every day just wears you out, and there's more to life. You know, when I got offered a job in in Australia. Um, I actually went out there for the interviews between Christmas and New Year. And, you know, I think it was around the 28th, 29th. Um, and I've just been offered the job. And I'm sitting down in Darling Harbour. I don't know if you've been to Australia, but sitting down in Darling Harbour, you've got the, um, oh, sorry, Circular Quay. Circular Quay. So I'm sitting at Circular Quay. I've got the Opera House to my right, and you've got the, um, the, the Harbour Bridge just in front of you. The ferry's going past, the water's glistening. That time of year in Sydney is just amazing. And I'm thinking, do I take this job? You know, I'm looking around and it was like th mid 30 degrees temperature. I thought, yeah, why not? It's a great opportunity. Uh, and it certainly beats, you know, that one and a half hour on a train coming into London each and every day. So, yeah, I've, have I still got a lot of that kind of wheeler dealer in me? I think so. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing all these deals, Mark. Um, mm. I think the what I'm trying to do now is, is those bigger kind of very transformative transactions for each and every one of the companies. And I think what we're doing, for instance, in Neo, with some of those acquisitions there, all of which were always planned. You know, I think we listed Neo almost 12 months ago and you, you were there. Um, but it was never meant to be a single project company there. It was always part of a bigger strategy of basically consolidating that uranium sector in, in South Africa because I saw an opportunity there. It's taken several months to get to it, but over the course of the rest of this month and October, you're going to get a company that's gone from having a single project with limited infrastructure and a dual compliant resource of, say, 5 million ounces, to then moving on and having a company that's going to have close to, what, 130, 140 million pounds of uranium, another five and, five and a half million ounces of gold, and a lot of infrastructure. So sometimes it takes a while to, to get there. But that strategy was there from the outset. So I think, have I changed in my kind of the way I do things? I think so. I'm tr I am looking, like I say, for that longevity. I'm looking for that stuff now, which is just more about quick fixes. Yeah, it, it's, it's more about just, yeah, a couple of quick shots of tequila. It's, it's about sitting there and having a nice whiskey and just enjoying it and savouring it for a bit longer. You mentioned, Jason, uh, just before we started recording, you were saying that you didn't have time for breakfast this morning. So I'm curious, what does a day look like? What does your day normally look like for Jason Brewer? What's your routine? It's my routine. Um, I'm usually in the office here about seven in the morning. Um, coffee is normally my breakfast. So that's it. So in here... Like I say, seven-ish coffee for breakfast. And then before everybody else gets here in the office, I've got about two hours of just clearing through everything. Uh, one of the great benefits about being here is you've got at the currently at the moment, what, two-hour time difference between the UK? And I think in a week or two's time, it goes to three hours. That's a godsend, actually. It allows me to really focus and get stuff done here and deal locally before then London wakes up. So it's, it's usually around lunchtime. You know, that London starts, you start to deal with London. And that actually works out quite well. So, mm. so yeah, my day is, is dealing with a lot of the local issues here in, in East Africa, in, in South Africa in the morning. Then, as you get into the afternoon, you're dealing with, with the UK. And, you know, I'm finishing here probably 12, 14 hour days. You know, and, and it's split between the various companies I'm involved with. Um, yeah, Marula, Neo. Shuka, Unicorn, 
um, the four listed companies. Plus, we've got our own, call it this private company here with myself and my partner, which we're we're growing a number of other businesses on the back of that. So, so yeah, it, it's just we've got an office here with what fifteen people uh, across all the different aspects: the finance side, the the PR side, the admin, uh, the charity is based here. You know, so there's a, a lot going on. So it's certainly true to say. Um, one day is never the same as the other, that's for sure. And where do you make the time for well-being in terms of yourself? You know, do you exercise? Are you focusing on, have you got a team of people that's looking after, you know, what you're eating? How do you, how do you manage that side of it? Um, yeah, we're very fortunate here. Look, one of the great things about being in Nairobi, you've got great food, great food, and it's all fresh food. So it's none of this manufactured rubbish that you get in the UK. Um, everything's fresh. So you do eat good, fresh food. There are great restaurants, but no, I mean, we get lunch here in the office for everyone and it, it, it's good traditional Swahili food, which, which I love. So yeah, that, that keeps me healthy. I suppose that's for sure. Um, the stress of the job keeps me healthy if, if that's the right way of describing it. Um, I've gone back, started back in the gym after a short break. So gym works great. Running, cycling, love running. That's a great way of clearing the head. Cycling, I can jump on the bike and just go for 30, 50 Ks at a time. That's nice. Um, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the, the adrenaline rush of, of cycling through Nairobi traffic. You know, that's, um, that's certainly not the safest of things to do at times. But no, mm. it's my wellness comes from just, look, I, I enjoy work, but it's also the company you keep. And the sure. company I keep, what keeps me keeps me going if you want to put it that way so mm. it's it's a very good enjoyable lifestyle here it's it's beautiful fresh air you know you can leave nairobi you can drive an hour and it's it's an amazing place so love that you you know one hour on a plane from nairobi and you can be in the masai mara one of the most beautiful national parks in the world or you can be on the coast and the coast there is just fantastic or alternatively, you know, an hour and 15 minutes and you're in Zanzibar, for Christ's sake. So, yeah, it's, it's a very good place to, to live, breathe and just enjoy life. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I can just go back, you know, you, you basically had a complete career in mining, haven't you? As you say, you had a choice to go in, be a seafarer or go into the mining um, industry. Um, so clearly you, you like that. You must have learned an awful lot along the way, different companies you've worked with, different commodities you've worked with, different jurisdictions, all the different projects that you've been involved in. You've obviously found yourself at home in, in Kenya, which is, which is fantastic. But if we can just perhaps go through some of the the previous roles and just think about perhaps some of the successes but also some of the failures and more importantly what those sort of perhaps uh, failures or challenges um, have taught you. I know that um, you've been involved in a few companies particularly Australia and you know I don't know if there's any kind of controversy around that you see that pop up sometimes on on the telegram groups about some of the companies you've been involved in but um, you know we can sort of talk about that set the record straight and, and really just yeah learn about some of the, the 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 key let's say the highs and the lows and and what you learned from both of those things yeah I think you you learn most when things don't go well you mm. don't that's that's the reality you learn most I'm actually working for some of the worst people in the world. <laughs> you know, you, you learn what not to do. So, you know, I've worked with some, some great people. I've worked with some terrible people. And it is probably from the latter that I've learned most. So, look, when I, I went from working for Dresdner, Klein or Benson, a very blue chip investment bank in, in the UK, did a lot of financings into Africa, predominantly, you know, East Africa, Tanzania. That was when some of the big gold mines with, the barracks of this world with the Anglo Gold Ashantis of this world. So great experience doing that. Then with Rothschilds, again, I don't think you get a better name in investment banking than, than Rothschilds. And, you know, some of the financings which I did into, into Africa, into Indonesia as well. I, I managed a lot of the Indonesia and, and PNG exposures. And, you know, I learned so much from that. Uh, what I learned from that in particular from those investment banking houses is reputation the importance of reputation. You're carrying their name, you know, so it's the family name. And that's why, for instance, the, the, the private business that I've got, uh, I've got here with, with, my, with my wife and my partner, it, it's got her name in it. And once you've got a, a name in a business, it, it does actually mean that much more. 
So, and that's one of the things which kind of, it determines how you conduct yourself, how you go about business. Because, you know, when it's just an, something else, when the name doesn't mean anything, you know, it's, you know, yeah, you, you tend not to take it for its true value, if you, want, if you want to put it that way. So, and again, that's why every company I'm involved with, there's a meaning behind the name. Neo, Marula, Shuka, you know, where we've changed those names, there's a reason why we've changed them. And there's always a story behind each and every one of those those uh, those names. You know, in Australia, I went from Rothschilds to running a number of resource funds. Mm. One of them was the Link Resources Fund, which was spun out of Rothschilds and was headed up by a guy called Clive Donner, who had a terrible reputation in the um, in the junior market in, in, in Perth, in West Perth. And my view was that he had such a great product. The fund was amazing. It was there to support junior companies developing things and so on. And it was a great product, but it just didn't have the right association with it. And I thought, you know what? I can get there. I can change that perception of it. And actually, if I can change the perception of it, then it's such an incredibly powerful tool and instrument and we can really grow that business. So I learned a lot about that. Um, I ran, I got involved with um, Taurus. Uh, Taurus Fund, which was from my relationships on the banking side with Mike Davies. Uh, Nick Far Jones is one of their top guys, the, the Australian rugby player there, who's part of that group. And again, it was all about reputation and, and so on. Got involved with that. And then through that, through both of those kind of groups, was investing in a lot of companies in, in, in Africa. And then I moved on to this side of the fence. And, you know, one of the first things was Continental Coal which was uh, an air sexisty coal company. And um, actually when I was at the fund, I put the first, I think $10 million into it to get it going. And Conti went from, again, it was a reverse takeover, a backdoor listing. And very quickly we got that producing from two mines, um, an offtake with EDF out of France, a, pre a $20 million prepayment from EDF, out of France, all again using some of the stuff which I learned from my banking days and so on. Um, changed the board to bring in some of the top mining professionals out of out of South Africa. You know, Bernard Swanepoel joined the board. Bernard's one of the top rated kind of executives there. Used to run Harmony Gold and so on. I had the head of um, Sushen Iron Ore. One of the, I think it's the world's one of the world's largest iron ore mines. The chairman of that came and joined. The board might kill bright, you know. So we transformed that company, but some of the initial people I was involved with there um, were just your, your, your kind of West Perth. I don't know how to describe it, but you know that had been in many junior companies. Um, Peter Landau, for instance, was one of those guys, and I worked with him for a number of years. Um, he's yeah, he's one of those characters where you learn an awful lot. But you learn more about what you shouldn't do as opposed, you know, just from seeing okay. what he did. So involved with him early on in my career. And, you know, mind you, that was like 10 years ago. So um, very quickly moved on, distanced myself from him. Ended up working with Tony Sage. Um, Tony Sage, another kind of West Australian mining entrepreneur, did very well in West Africa with some of the iron ore, did very well in um, – in Western Australia with some of the iron ore. He's actually behind the lithium mine in Austria, which sits in another company which did a backdoor listing onto the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, again, it's one of those things. It's, what is it? Um, it's like Vegemite, or in, in your case, what, Marmite. You know, you, you love it or hate it. it it's, it's, there's no in-between. So from working with Tony, Again, somebody who had a great way of kind of polarizing investors, love him or hate him. Right. But, you know, very successful. I actually worked with him. I ran the football club there for a couple of years with him, um, the Perth Glory. And, again, that was something which, um, again, it showed me that I really need to better understand everything that's happening. You know, I can't rely on other people to, to um to confide, to show me what's really happening beneath the surface, if you want to call it that. So lessons learned. A number of junior companies as well, which had great, great runs, you know, Force Commodities, uh, Winmar Resources. Force was one of the top performing lith junior lithium stocks. I think it was the top performing junior lithium stock back in the early 2020s. 
Uh, Windmar as well went from 0.1 of a cent up to 20 cents. You know, fantastic return. But unfortunately, we were unable to close one of those transactions there, which was a big um, cobalt project in, in the DRC. So, look, I've been involved in a number of companies which have done incredibly well for investors, some which have not done so well. Some I've left and have then subsequently had problems two, three, four, five years down the track. Um, but because of my involvement early on, which was tended to be quite high profile involvement early on, that distinction of you know what happens two, three, four, five years after I've left, I'm still associated with it. Same way as you know, working with someone 10, 15 years ago, you're still associated with them. You know, you're guilty by association, even though you distanced yourself, you've moved on and you've done things in a different way. And you do things in a different way because you see what they've done. And you haven't necessarily agreed with it. You know, mm. there's there's other companies which I've been involved with where, again, when I've come here to Kenya, for instance, and it was quite apparent that I, I, I saw how things were going on. And, I, again, that's not how I want to work. Yeah. I, I want to work in, in the right way. You know, yes, I get things done quickly, but there's no shortcuts taken. Yeah, you know, we, we get there quickly because we've got a great team about us. And one of the things I learned from my involvement in a number of these other companies was you can't have other people behind the scenes pulling the strings. Mm -hmm. You can't have other people behind there having big controlling influence and telling you how you should be doing things, mm -hmm. you know, because they've got different agendas, they've got different motives, which is why, you know, you surround yourself with a good team not necessarily people that think the same way, you know, people that will actually have their say and it's complementary. You know, like I say, working with some people, you know, it's that yin and yang type thing. You, you always need people that give a different perspective. Mm. So when I was working there in Australia, Australia is a great kind of entrepreneurial um, place to be, especially West Perth, you know, but the best thing I ever did was get away from West Perth and not, you know, distance myself from that kind of, Okay. You, know, you, you can get so sucked up on it, sucked up into it, that you actually forget the bigger picture. It's all mm. about driving share price. It's all about getting, raising more capital, raising more capital and going from this to this to this. No, that's not what would I want to say, be. Jason, would you say it was a similar experience to what you had in London? Because, of course, you climbed the ladder over here in London in terms of investment banking. You know, you spoke about that. And then you realised it wasn't for you went over to Australia and of course you know you're talking about your experiences there um and it what it sounds like from what you're saying it, it wasn't the way you wanted to do business absolutely um but I don't think I'm done I don't think I'm too much different to anybody else I just I think the one thing I I like to do is almost like back myself you know it's actually think okay get moving away from a call it a comfort zone and stepping into something else. You know, I like I said, I moved over here four years ago and knew no one, knew no one, and came here to set up a business and grow a business. And I was very fortunate to meet a very special person that's uh, enabled me to work the way I am now. But um, no, it's, yeah, it is. It's, it's probably getting away, like I said earlier on, from the status quo, from that comfort zone and always wanting to, to kind of better myself, improve myself, or just do something else, do something mm. different. It's not like, I don't think I've got ADHD. That, that could probably explain a few things for me. But um, no, no, I just want to be something better. Yeah, okay. I, I don't think I'm willing to accept what people are expecting of me. And how do you measure that? You know, when you say you always want to better yourself, um, you want to be become a, a better version of yourself. And, and, you know, from what you're saying, that's, you, you know, you're, you're on that journey. But do you, do you sit back and reflect and think, am I growing as a person? Or is it just something that happens for you naturally? No, I'm, I'm always probably one of my worst critics, actually. Um, and I always think I can be doing more. I think... Don't men always blame their mothers for a lot of things? Don't they? I think that's some something always, but you know, I've I guess I've always grown up in an environment where, you know, I've always got to be not pleasing others, but I've always got to be doing something. Um, my mother never never let me 
sit around the, the lounge or sit down. No, no, she always used to give me a cuff to the back of the head and tell me to get out there and do something. So, you know, that's how do I judge how successful? No, just I'll let other people judge that. And if other people do well off being involved with me, fantastic. But no, nah, uh, I'm never satisfied. Do you, do you stop and take time and celebrate your successes? You know, when you get that big hit, when you get that success and you think, yeah, okay, that's exactly the result I was looking for. Do you celebrate it or are you straight on to the next one? You, you've hit the nail on the head there. We've talked about this so many times here in the office. We never get to celebrate successes because you, you, you do something, but then you're already on to the next one. And it's something we've said here that we should do more of because – some of the things we do, you know, we almost take for granted, you know, getting some of these deals done in, in some of these countries, we, we do like that, like that. Um, and I know for some people it takes them forever. You know, I'm actually involved in one company where 12 months later we're still trying to close the deal. In the meantime, I've done six deals with one of the other companies. You know, so, you know, when we do close this deal, I'll be very happy with that, obviously. Um, but I don't think I'll have time to celebrate it when perhaps we should, you know, because we've done a lot. We've just, we're going to be closing off doing formal documentation on one of the um, uh, NEO transactions for Baza North and Baza South. Truly transformative deal. Um, but the problem is we'll, we'll get that signed up, formal documentation with the lawyers later this week. But already we're working with lawyers on two other transactions. So you don't get time to to enjoy it or celebrate your successes when probably you should. And it's something, like I say, we've talked about here. We should because it is quite an achievement. Mm, mm, excellent. There's a couple of other points we want to, I think, cover on the podcast. I think, your, 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 of course, your charity work, Mayfair, we, we want to. I know Pam's quite keen to explore that. I wonder if I could just jump in just a little bit before and just, just think about to Jason Brewer, the, the, the iteration at the moment of, of Jason Brewer and everything that's going on with Marula. And just thinking of if some of those legacy things, as you said, like you are quite high profile, you know, you put your head above the parapet, you, you've got to take the good and the bad, you know, that, that's how it goes. Um, and, you know, you've, you, I wonder if there's, uh, you know, there's probably still some hangover, of course, from, from, from past experiences there. But how do you plan on sort of, you know, making this, this version, this, 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 uh, this journey that you're on now? And of course, for all the shareholders who are really quite, you know, keen supporters of you, you know, you see in the telegram groups, people really are engaged with you. How do you plan on, on well, doing them proud as well as, as well as yourself and, and your team out in, in Kenya? Well, I think it's, it, it's just hard work, Mark. It's, it's just hard work, willing to put in the effort to get this done. And I think, you know, one thing, I might call it my father gave me, it was instilled that thing that, you know, if you work hard, you do get your just desserts. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you put in that effort, um, you can do it. You can break those barriers down. You know, I, I always use the analogy, you know, you keep knocking at the door. If nobody answers, you start kicking the door in. Yeah, that's that's how you get things done. It's that persistence, that determination. So, you know, for the various companies that I'm involved with, and I am, I'm probably too engaging with a lot of the, you know, that's been one of the criticisms I've, I've faced. I'm probably too engaging with shareholders, with people that contact me, because I, I think, look, as a director of a company, you have to be. You know, you've got to be able to accept the criticism. You've got to be able to accept the plaudits. Um, unfortunately, you can't please everybody all the time. And that's one thing I've certainly learned. But, you know, for those people that are, are, are supporters of me, uh, they can, I guess, rest easy to know that I'm, I'm not going to give up from trying in a lot of these things. It's going to come, things may take a little bit longer, as, as I think you pointed out, and, and sometimes for reasons beyond your control. But, you know, I, I will continue to, to work my hardest to make this successful because, again, I put a lot of money into a lot of these companies as well. You know, that's, that's the thing. I'm not one of those directors that's sitting there and, and taking, taking a monthly salary and, and taking various share options and this, that, the other. I've, in all the companies, I've invested more than, far, far more than what I've taken in a salary. And in, you mentioned the charity, which I've done as well. You know, for two of the companies, my money goes straight through to those charities um, because that's what, again, it's more about just being a successful mining entrepreneur. It's about giving back. And that's, again, one of the things I've learned so much from being here in Kenya. 
And let's talk about those charities now. But before we go into the details of it, you just mentioned that it's important to give back. Why is that? Why is that important to you? It's one of those things where you nobody's ever successful in their own right. You're always successful because of the people that are there with you. You never get somewhere in your own right. You get there because of the people that are with you. And one of the things I guess I've, I've recognised is that, you know, if I can give to somebody else so that they can get to where they want to go, then as they get there, they'll also lift others up with them. So for me, it, it's almost creating that environment where others kind of follow suit. And it's, it's not just one individual, it's two. It, it's, it, it's then that multiplier effect. So for me, it's about, rate. like I say, it's, it's not about me being successful. It's about everybody else being able to enjoy and benefit from the success and grow and, and be successful in their own right. So, you know, one of the things I think from being here is, I think there was some re- report I saw the other day Kenya is ranked second in the world as being the most charitable, okay? And when I read that and saw that, I thought, absolutely, absolutely, it's, it is. And that's because of the way the people are and are brought up to be. And I think the, the first world, the, the UK, the Australians, no, no, it's a very selfish environment, okay? It's all about you or you've got your immediate family there. Whereas here, it's the concept of family extends so much bigger. So that's just had such an influence on me. And like I say, I've been very, very fortunate since I've been here to be um, to be in a relationship now, which has taught me to be a better person and, and instilled those values in me. But I think those values were always there. They were just hidden away with the kind of the environment I've been kind of started my career in the UK, in the city, and in Australia too. It took me to come here to kind of rediscover myself and and become that person that gives more now. Yeah. And one of the charities that you're involved in is the Mayflower Children's Foundation. And there was a a time a few months ago when I was going to interview you, Jason, and you were actually outside in the park because you were just about to do some charity work and behind you was all these children and it looked amazing. Tell us a little bit more about that. What do you do there? Yeah, that was with the school uh, out in Juja where the charity actually did something on Friday down there, a sporting event. But before that, we'd gone out there and um, to be clear, that's headed up by by Jacqueline Shai here um, and by a number of other women involved in that charity, Kate Gankochi, uh, and everybody around her, they set up a, a feeding program in the school. So ensuring that each child has, has breakfast in the morning, because um, many children here don't get full meals each day. So we set up a, a feeding program there. So that was, I think that was when it was just launch pan when I was there. So going there to those schools, and it's what, it's an hour outside of, out of Nairobi or from Nairobi. So going there and seeing that and seeing what you can achieve by, by so little is amazing and how that sets the children up as well. So, yeah, getting involved in there in feeding programs, in providing school equipment, sporting equipment. Um, Mayflower Children's all about health and education. And I guess the people that are behind that charity here who I support and, and, and really get involved as much as I can, they're doing an amazing job. And there's, there's so much more which we can do here with that as well. And what other charities are you involved in? Oh, that's the, the main one here. With Mayflower Children's, there's a, there's a number of, I guess, associated or, or similar charities that, that do work. So there's occasions where there's some joint initiatives there and you go and you see them work. You just, just, like I say, when you're in Kenya and you see how much people give, not just of their time, but financially, um, it's 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 mind blowing. You know, I sit here and you know I see I see people in the office here paying school fees for for distance cousins. Mm-hmm. You know, donating this, donating that, and you know I know how tough it is for people here as as it is that are working. And when you see that these people are then are supporting you know, distant relatives with children's school fees and, and so on. It just makes you 
realize again how people are brought up here it's, it's an incredibly it's it's still a very kind of traditional environment very christian one those christian values which i think many developing countries have lost but i think you know that concept of giving uh is is, is something which is throughout here now so i'm thriving in this environment i'm loving it and i'm, I'm doing things now not for me but for others which which i guess yeah what can you say about that yeah yeah it sounds like you've really taken on the ethics of uh, you know the the mindset of the kenyans uh, you've mentioned it a lot of times it, through this podcast, you know, that uh, concept of family being beyond immediate family, the concept of giving. Um, and it sounds like, you know, you, you've really taken that on in your daily life as well with your work that you're doing. Look, I think, like I said, I put that down to one very special person who's had such an impact on my life here. And I'm a better person because of that and because of the environment I'm in now. So yeah. Tell us more there, Jason, because, of course, this is about... This talk is about you, Jason. So we we, we want to hear, you know, who is no, this? No, it's, it's inappropriate to do so. But look, know that for me, and you've got to keep things, yeah, there's things you keep private. There's things which you enjoy being around. But I think for me now as a person, and I've said this to so many people, I've never worked so well. Yeah. And the reason you work so well, I think, is... It's how it, it's all in the mindset. It's all yeah. in the mindset. And when you're in the, you know, when you're a hard put working person anyway by your nature, that's great. But then when you're in that right environment too, it can be so conducive to doing things. And I think the culture here of everybody, you know, you've got what over 80% of people don't have full time employment here. You know, so everybody's out there trying to make a living, trying to support their families and, and so on. So there's a very, whether you want to call it entrepreneurial, everybody's hustling. Everybody's trying to, to better themselves. So when you work in that environment, it's and when you're around those sort of people in that mindset, it, it, it rubs off on you. And that's something I've really enjoyed. Absolutely. And it sounds like you're sharing that mindset now with others, with the work that you're doing. Very much. Well, thank you very much, Jason. It's been a pleasure doing this uh, podcast with you. I wonder if we can just finish off, um, and I'd like to sort of say 30 seconds on on each of the projects just to set where you are on them and the plans. We've got Blesberg, Lithium, Canusi, Copper, Nayori, Nayori, Graphite, Larisoro, Manganese, and Bagamoyo, Graphite. Can you do 30 seconds on each of those projects, the status quo um, and what the next steps are? Jeez, okay. Blesberg, um Mining rights uh, application being finally submitted next week. Uh, joint venture on the installation of a leaching plant to produce an intermediary product to be announced very shortly. Um, expansion into the surrounding areas on the Northern Cape and focusing on the tungsten and tantalum to commence in October. That's Blesberg. Right. Lucy, uh, Stuart Maremi, one of the directors of Tequila. Up on site, new compressor, new air leg drills, open pit mining to commence and be stockpiled ahead of processing later this quarter and announcements on the plans to commence copper cathode production in 2025 in a much expanded, bigger scale project to, to be made as well over the course of this week. Um, Nuri Nuri uh, and the various graphite projects in Tanzania um, further work to be done there on the processing rather than producing a, a high-grade DSO, which is a very easy thing to do. Actually look at ways of doing the processing, a very quick processing route to produce that large medium, sorry, that large jumbo flake production and get that product out um, early in 2025. Uh, the manganese here, uh, continued exports from Larisora, which is the mine up in Samburu County. Uh, new equipment set to arrive in early October, new processing plant uh, commissioned end of October, November. Uh, Khalifi, some modifications being made to the plant. Uh, the jigs reinstalled there. Um, product to start arriving there this time next week and processed material to be sold into the export markets before the end of October. Okay. Did I... I think I've touched on all of them now. Bagamoyo. Um, Bagamoyo, again, 
Looking at that, you've got 22 mining licenses there. We've got to consolidate that down to a more manageable process. You've got the two prospects which were identified previously. We're working with Said to basically work out what the focus is there because it was such a big project opportunity for us. And we need to compare that to what we've got at Nuri Nuri and Nuri Green to kind of prioritize. Much as I love to do everything, we've got to prioritize Bagamoyo, Nuri Nuri, Nuri Green. Um, okay. The cobalt at Mancina at Cruz Riviere in South Africa, initial work to commence in October, focusing on that very high grade cobalt plus the, the gold which is associated with that gold, which is anywhere from three to five ounces per ton, and cobalt, which is between eight and 15%. So a very good opportunity there. Um, I think that's it. Further rare earth opportunities in East Africa. Um, the rare earth project we had in Zambia, you know, I don't think it's delivered in terms of our ability to access it and work on it. So there's a far more advanced rare earth project near-term production that we're looking at in East Africa. Okay, excellent. Well, yeah, you've got your core projects there that we talk about quite a lot on the other projects there that yeah. we, like you say, uh, Cruz Riviere and, and Kilifi, they're all, uh, and of course, the Northern Cape Tungsten yeah. and, and the Rare Earth as well, which, uh, yeah, would be more back burner projects. Plenty going on, Jason, and sounds like plenty more still to come. Yes, indeed. Um, a series of announcements this week on, on Marula, um and hopefully on the other companies as well because there's been tremendous progress with them so Excellent. juggling would, would 2025 would be the year for the company would it do you think jason company making year unlocking the funds from auo quinton coming out all guns blazing i see the memes that go out on the on x there we're just getting started is that the, yeah, that the phrase look, yeah look quinton's got to deliver with the fund that fund unlocks so much for us it really does and i think sometimes when you spend such a Corner, an incubation period with him where you build that relationship um, that really allows you then when the um, the keys to the to the vault get given to you you can actually you know you can move ahead with a lot of knowing that you're doing it in the right way you know he's probably taken a bit longer to, to close off that that fund but that's given us more time to actually work on right how we're going to do things and I think that will put us in very good stead like I said I think in the interview we did with you Mark he said it's allowed us to look at some of the projects and look at them in the, the bigger picture as to how they can be delivered on. And you're going to see that at Blesberg. I also just mentioned there at Canusi. I think the graphite as well will, will be wrapped up in that as, you know, as well. Um, and the manganese here, there's a big capital allocation coming to the manganese here in, in Kenya for us. So with that, we can do so much here. That's for sure. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time. Jason Brewer, uh, CEO of Marula Mining, and of course, Pam Sidhu, co-hosting the podcast today. Thank you very much. It's been great to speak to you, Jason. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you for listening to another podcast from Market Musing. Tune in next time.